Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware of it, but we'll do this event in English. Uh, as we know, there are a few people in the audience that don't speak Dutch. Um, we want to welcome you very much at Impact Center for Media Culture. And we're very happy to have as our guest tonight, Maarten van der Einde. He's sitting over there. Please give him a warm applause. Um, Maarten van der Einde is, yeah, he's the own, no. He's one of the few artists in the exhibition here, A World Without Us, that has more than one work in his show. Um, we are exhibiting uh, two of his works um, that were, I must say, excellent matches with the concept of our exhibition, A World Without Us. A World Without Us, as you can read on the uh, label at the entrance, tries to imagine um, what our world would look like when there are no more humans on this planet tries also to discuss how that could happen and how other species than human beings uh, could overtake the planet, what artificial intelligence uh, might mean in this process. Um, so I would invite you uh, to have a look maybe after the talk um, to see the show, to see more of the show, including uh, Martin's von der Neinde's piece, uh, Homo Stupidus Stupidus, that you can see over there. Um, I'm sure you will talk about that piece also in your uh, talk. Um, and at the entrance, you've all seen um, the small plinth um, with uh, posters on it. Um, that Those posters are the work Zoology of Genetology. It's part of a bigger work that Martin will also talk about. I all invite you to, if you want, to take one of these posters. Um, these posters are choirs of what uh, could, will, or maybe already has become a book. Martin will uh, say more about that. Um, so you're welcome to take one of these posters home. Um, I would like to thank very much uh, the Bakkegrond, the Institute for Flemish Culture in Amsterdam, that has helped us to organize uh, this event and invite Martin van den Einde to come to Utrecht and give a talk here. Please give him a warm applause. Good evening. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation uh, from Impact and the Brakke Grond. Um, yeah, I will, I will start to talk a little bit about uh, the, the poster in the beginning uh, because um, I, I didn't plan to, uh, but I will, it, it helps to give context uh, to uh, my work in general. And, um, the science, I would say, that uh, most works uh, originate from. Um, I will start with, with this work to introduce uh, the science because it lays at uh, the, the, the beginning of the, the creation of it. Uh, it. This work is called Restauration du Lac de Montbel, Restoration of the, 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 the Lake in uh, Montbel. And it, it, it's, it's a futile, um, almost utopian attempt to restore uh, something that is broken. And this idea to um, fix something is, 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 uh, is part of, of many of my, my works. Um, but from, um, from a future past perspective, and this is where uh, the science comes in, the genetology. It's uh, a science that I invented uh, in 2003. Um, as a result of um, research on the end of the world. Uh, when I graduated from the, the Rietveld Academy, I, I wrote my final thesis on, on the end of the world, which uh, was very depressing and uh, caused me a few years to somehow over, overcome uh, this, this doom um, scenario thinking. And my solution was uh, to basically skip the apocalypse and try to imagine what remnants would be uh, left over afterwards. And uh, so uh, genetology um, is uh, an attempt to, to imagine a, a future past. And I, I had to invent it because it doesn't exist. Uh, I, was, I was really surprised that, that only um, its opposite science, the eschatology, the science of last things, is an actual existing science. But the science of first things is, is non-existent, at least not as a, as a word. Um, but it is being used in, in a lot of uh, existing sciences as uh, more and more uh, sciences try to imagine 
um, how the world would look like and what um, connection it would have with, with their uh, field of study, like archaeology, um, geology, uh, but also zoology. Uh, all these sciences uh, include now um, future thinking in, in, in their research. So it is being used, but it hasn't been coined. And that was the whole idea with this uh, publication, of which you see uh, only one page, Zoology of Genetology, is uh, to match one existing science with genetology in order to help me define what that uh, non-existing science actually is, what it studies, uh, and so on. I only managed to make four pages. Uh, so if you see uh, the poster, it is uh, one choir, something that you fold in two, uh, and that's the actual size of the book. So it, it, it had to become uh, an enormous kind of uh, yeah, alternative encyclopedia, something you could smash somebody's head in. But, but it, it's very uh, labor intensive to, to, to make and, and super expensive. It costs 2,000. 500 euros a page, so I was only able to make it in the framework of an exhibition where it was um, supported uh, at the, that the production of a new page was being made. But before that, um, I had to gather all the information. So uh, what you see on the pages are uh, a few of my own works, um, a lot of other works from other artists, scientific discoveries, uh, texts, uh, philosophical thoughts, uh, specifically relating to uh, the combination of that existing science and genetology. And so for zoology of uh, genetology, I asked if I could reprint the original text um, uh, that uh, Alan Weisman wrote of which he wrote, uh, later made a book, A World Without Us. So the original uh, essay is on the back side. Um, and yeah, I was very happy that he allowed me to uh, reprint it uh, for this occasion. OK, so um, in the beginning, uh, 2003, it was, it was a concept. Um, and as I said, uh, this, this, uh, I used the blog uh, website for me, which was like a kind of a sketchbook, genetology.net. It's still online, although I don't update it anymore since 2014. Um, because I, I wasn't sure what it was uh, myself. And it, it, it's through the making of different works that I uh, slowly started to understand what it actually was and, and, and uh, how to use it. And it, it, it's something that I uh, still would say is, is part of a, a framework or, or the backbone of my art practice, but I don't specifically mention it uh, in, a, in the title uh, anymore, but it, it helped me to have a certain way <clears throat> of looking at uh, material and, and, and objects. So as you can see here, uh, this, this still has a reference to it in the title. It's uh, genet genetologic research number two and four. Uh, it's really at the beginning of, of, um, of that research. And here you see um, uh, remnants of wood uh, in the form of beams and sticks that are reassembled to recreate a tree. And it's this uh, thought exercise that I did with many materials um, to imagine, okay, uh, what kind of leftovers could there be? And if, uh, through the constant evolution of, of history, if there are <clears throat> holes in the knowledge or, or misinterpretations that occur through the passing of time and through the disappearance of certain parts of knowledge, how will organisms or people um, put the puzzle back together again? And um, here I used uh, as a reference the end of a wooden stick, which has a, a piece of a puzzle, let's say, uh, of the year rings. And um, I tried to puzzle it back together again. It, it's not a complete match, as you can see, but it is somehow uh, arriving back at a, a circle. And then uh, you, you could imagine that um, a tree comes out uh, of it. And this is, of course, speculating on, on the, the, the possibility that at a certain moment in time, there are no more trees, but we are left with all 
all, all these pieces of, yeah, I don't know if we would call it wood, but all these pieces that clearly come from somewhere. And, and if the whole notion of a tree and, and, and the form of it is gone, how do you come back uh, to something that resembles a tree? <clears throat> Um, around 2005, um, I, I dove much more uh, into the, the, the research of what, what genetology actually is. Um, the first uh, signs that I matched um, to genetology, it's also the first page that I made, is archaeology of genetology. And it started um, when I was in, in, in Japan doing um, a residency to learn to make um, traditional uh, Japanese teacups. And it's not on a wheel, yeah, you make it by hand. It's a very labor and intensive work, uh, very complicated um, and, and frustrating. I mean, I, I was, I'm not trained as a ceramist. It was through, through a... Um, yeah, a, a, a special occasion that I found myself uh, under the wings of a, a professional sensei uh, teaching me the, the art of ceramics. I was there three months, it was before the internet uh, time, so I was, I was really in an isolated place. Um, people didn't speak English. Uh, and at a certain moment, I, I just threw the cup on the floor uh, out of frustration. And when looking at the, the, the shreds, the pieces, um, uh, it, it all of a sudden uh, clicked and, and I saw the, the value of uh, creating contemporary uh, archaeology um, with uh, the, the future in mind. And this is one step further in, in it was, yeah, the year after I was, in, I was in Rome when I read in the newspaper that the IKEA catalog became the most printed book in human history, passing the Bible for the first time ever. And I was like, whoa, uh, it was the third page, small article. For me, it was front page news. Um, because the consequences are, are quite severe, I would say. Uh, if, if in the far future, uh, something or we, if you're still there in a different shape, form, uh, start to dig in the ground and arrive at the current layer that represents society today, uh, probably they will find material uh, from, from IKEA because it's so widespread. So I went to uh, Ikea, bought a cup, <clears throat> and climbed over the fence in uh, Il Foro Romanum, the old uh, historic heart uh, in Rome, uh, and buried it in the ground to, to help future archaeologists a little bit. Um, you don't see the uh, flabbergasted tourists uh, behind uh, the camera, but they were uh, like on the, on the fence looking like this. Um, and then we started running, obviously, afterwards. I don't know if they discovered it uh, or not. Um, but um, it, was, it was very literal. Uh, it was the, the, same, the same week that I read the article. It took me uh, m much longer to, I would say, um, reach the final stage of this uh, um, project. <clears throat> it happens a lot with works that, that they stick with you or the concept of a work sticks with you for several years and that you create different appearances of, of a work. Um, so after also restoring an actual IKEA cup, um, I went much further um, thinking also of, of, of this uh, yeah, past amazement when I uh, visited archaeological exhibitions, when, when you see these big vases and they only have like uh, three shreds. You know, I, I was always surprised, uh, like how, how do they, uh, managed to know the actual size, uh, the, the width, uh, the curves, and, and so on, with so little pieces. And, and that's where this uh, speculation uh, comes in, which is also a very important, important part of, of um, uh, my work, and I would say uh, the science of first things, because there's always information missing, uh, even, even, uh, even, even today, but I will talk a little bit more about that when we come to uh, the Homo stupidus stupidus. So here uh, you have an IKEA cup, which is restored, um, arriving at the vase, which is, for us, uh, not the right shape, but in the future it might actually be the right shape. <clears throat> here I had the opportunity uh, for, for, um, to include an IKEA catalog next to uh, uh, an old copy of the Bible in the old uh, Dominican library in Ghent uh, on the occasion of the opening uh, of the, it was at that time the biggest IKEA 
uh, branch in, in Europe, in Ghent, and um, I approached um, the, the, the manager and I, I asked him if he would, wanted to come uh, with an IKEA catalog and then we would include it in, in, uh, in the cabinets which are normally never opened. Eh? It's like uh, preserved knowledge. Um, and yeah, uh, he, he liked the idea. I didn't ask him to come in his IKEA suit, but he did, <laughs> which added uh, somehow <coughs> a little bit uh, to the magic. And the funny thing was, it was December, but he already printed uh, the catalog of 2009. It was December 2008. And the, the logo or, or the, um, the, the, the tagline, let's say, of the, the, uh, the promotional campaign of 2009 was Live Now. And yeah, when you come with a printed book in 2008 saying Live Now and uh, for 2009, uh, it, was, it was the perfect, uh, perfect match. So yeah, um, uh, here we arrive at um, the work that is in the, in the exhibition, Homo Stupidus Stupidus, which uh, deals specifically with this um, loss of, of knowledge. So I uh, deassembled uh, a human skeleton uh, and put it back together again without any notion of anatomy. Uh, the only thing that was uh, left out is, is the crane, eh, where, where also the brain is, and the storage of memory. Um, uh, partly because it is so such, such a recognizable uh, shape and form, but also because that's exactly what is, uh, what is missing. And <clears throat> I don't know if it's there. No, it's not there. Um, and, and here, um, yeah, also something. Um, Strange happened um, because half a year after I made the work, uh, they discovered Ida in Germany, which is um, at that time they thought it was the missing link between the primates and um, the humanoids. And um, now they don't; they know that it isn't. But at that time, it was it was really a big big discovery. And the fossil, uh, when you look at it from above, it looked almost identical to uh, the Homo stupidus stupidus, uh, with the tail and everything, the legs, and it, yeah, it, was, it was really uh, extraordinary. But for me, obviously, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a big critique on, on I would say, yeah, human arrogance. Uh, how on earth did we ever uh, dare to call ourselves double wise men? You know, uh, Homo sapiens already is, uh, I would say, questionable. But the double wise man, I mean, seriously, uh, I think it's, uh, <clears throat> if you look at the current state of the world, I would say <laughs> uh, not the right choice. And <clears throat> so this is, now we're 2008, yeah. Um, this is the first work where I really uh, um, focused on, on geology and on the different uh, geological layers, uh, uh, and then specifically the one that we are constructing right now. So this is a, a core drill that uh, follows the different uh, human evolutions, but through the use of material. And uh, these different eras, uh, uh, not all of them, but uh, a lot of them have a specific name, like uh, the Stone Age, so it starts with, with a big lump of, of stone. And then you have uh, pieces of wood uh, that uh, make reference to uh, the control uh, over fire, which I think was the most uh, yeah, important event uh, for the, the evolution of humankind, because afterwards, uh, yeah, we, uh, we could m melt metals and create glass and, and preserve materials, our stomachs changed because we could prepare food and so on and so on. So, so being able to control fire kick-started uh, the domination on, on the planet. So uh, wood and then you have um, uh, copper and bronze, um, bricks, uh, asphalt, uh, no, concrete, asphalt, tar, and the top layer, uh, plastic. And the timing was also... Um, Crucial, I couldn't have planned it better. Um, 
it, it was a commission for uh, Generali Foundation, uh, which is yeah one of the biggest uh, insurers uh, in Europe. They had a, a gathering with their CEOs in the training center in Germany, and for the occasion, they wanted to uh, have a, a big monument. Um, but it was also the, the, the weekend in which uh, Lehman Brothers uh, fell and the whole economic crisis uh, uh, came out. So these guys, they were extremely nervous, checking their Blackberries the whole time, see the courses, uh, the stock market crash. Um, and at the end, uh, the, the, the sculpture was covered with a, with a white cloth. I did a speech about uh, the future, uh, making reference with genetology, but also yeah, a little bit of a, a, a kick under their butts that they uh, had to do uh, much more than just trying to um, uh, cover uh, themselves uh, if uh, future calamities would, would be a threat to their uh, current business model, because that was, uh, that was what the gathering was about, um, uh, time, business opportunity, and strategic timing. Um, so we toasted. <clears throat> in uh, with champagne in plastic champagne glasses I gathered the glasses and then I went up with a crane and melted them um, on the on the top uh, and then we unveiled uh, the work so then they could see what they were contributing to and what you also see uh, through the um, the progress uh, is that the evolution of new inventions and new materials follow after each other faster and faster and faster and faster. It also makes a reference to this idea of, of, uh, of singularity. And um, the top layer, it's such a thin and fragile layer that it actually can't uh, serve as a foundation for the next material uh, invention. And this uh, was for me also the beginning of a, a longer research project on, on plastic and plastic pollution of which at that time, 2008, there was very little uh, known. Um, it was, I was still working on, on this uh, uh, genetology.net website, so I was a lot uh, looking on the internet and, and while searching for materials that might survive human civilization, I came across an article um, of uh, Charles Moore, uh, the, the catamaran sailor who, who discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in the, in the Pacific. Uh, at that time, they didn't even know that there were like five major areas uh, with plastic. And I think there were maybe 10 articles uh, in total on, on the internet. And whenever I told somebody uh, about plastic floating in the ocean, nobody, nobody knew about it. Today, it's uh, uh, of course very different. So that, that resulted, uh, to see, yeah, this one. Um, that resulted in a, in a five year long uh, project in which I uh, visited uh, all the five gyres on, on different uh, locations, all the red dots you see there. So between 2008, 2012, either by boat or uh, by plane, uh, I visited, uh, yeah, as close as I could to the, the center of, of the gyres to collect uh, plastic debris. Uh, and uh, I melted it uh, to make it resemble color, coral reefs. And, yeah, um, and after uh, five years, it reached the size of four and a half by five meters, weighing about one ton. And this is where it was uh, exhibited um, uh, after after the five years, <clears throat> and the the resemblance with with coral reef is something that yeah came about while just trying to um, transform the material into something more than what it just was eh? because there is. Uh, you, can, you can you can fetishize um, the actual pieces that you find either floating around or on a beach, but it it it, it looks very much like the thing it is. Um, and yeah, I would say there is uh, there have been quite a lot of artists also working with that in the past. Uh, Tony Crack, long time ago, Mark Dyan, and so on. So for me, it was really important to bring it back to a, a different kind of form and shape. Also trying to imagine how Will, will nature uh, deal with, with all this material and how uh, will it look in, 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 a, in 
long, uh, far away future. And by, by melting it, uh, it, it got this organic uh, form again. And at that time, there was not really a connection between um, coral reefs and uh, plastic pollution. For me, I remember writing about it in the beginning to, to also to get the project funded, that I was combining uh, two different environmental problems and, and putting them together. And it's only after uh, I finished the work that they discovered that uh, coral uh, is actually uh, using microplastics uh, to continue to build its uh, skeleton or its uh, its its uh, its house, let's say, and basically it's poisoning itself, and that's uh, one of the big reasons that the Great Barrier Reef is disappearing. It's also because of uh, plastic pollution. So there, they came uh, together. I made a few other works also with plastic because hey, it, it was a, it was a five year long project, um, and uh, as I said before, uh, usually there's uh, certain concepts of works or or um, ways of of looking at the material, and usually they they develop over time and get different uh, different kinds of outcomes. Uh, so here I was more imagining. Um, um, yeah, how, how different stone formations uh, could uh, change or group or, or cluster uh, plastic. And uh, I looked at uh, these sand roses, which are uh, yeah, very beautiful forms. Uh, so I tried to remake them with, with uh, small pieces, uh, pieces of plastic. And yeah, this is also a work that that went together, I would say, with with um, the making of plastic reef, uh, um, but it it focuses more specific on uh, microplastic, which I would say is a much uh, greater threat um, than than the big pieces that are floating around, um, because it's so it's it's so unconceivably uh, widespread. Um, that, yeah, I, I don't think there is any way of, of, uh, of solving that problem. Uh, I, th I think for this we actually rather need to change ourselves in, instead of the environment so that we can adapt uh, to the plastic pollution instead of the other way around. Um, I guess uh, you all know Boyan Slat uh, with the, the ocean cleanup, uh, which is specifically focused on on larger pieces and also surface plastic, because that's also something important to know, is that, um, well, first of all, only 30% of all plastics float. 70% sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So there you already have a selection. And of that 30% uh, of floating plastic, um, it, it, it migrates in a water column of 100 meters. So depending on the temperature and the movement, it, 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 it moves up like this. So when you scoop over it uh, with, uh, with a big machine and you take away the surface plastic, if that works at all, because you had to retreat because the thing is not working, uh, I mean, you just take such a small fraction um, that I wonder whether it's, uh, whether it's worth it. Uh, but the biggest problem, obviously, uh, is, is, is the small bits. And uh, at this time, they didn't even discover the nanoplastic, yeah, which is something that they focus on right now, uh, which is even a larger problem because it's airborne and it's in any kind of water source. So it comes out of your tap, it's in uh, bottled drinking water, it's in your beer. Uh, it's, it's, it's so abundantly present everywhere that there's no way of filtering it or cleaning it. Okay, so this... Um, and this maybe uh, illustrates it a bit. It's uh, the entire globe that is covered in plastic debris. <clears throat> um, this is uh, uh, a work, um, I th no, not the first. It's a permanent installation in, in France on top of a, an old garbage uh, dump. And it, it tries to imagine how and what kind of material uh, might be left over, not just uh, humanity, but maybe from one 
person in one lifetime. How much material do we gather uh, and how do we yeah, keep it together? If you would visualize everything that we use or buy in a lifetime, how much would it be? Um, so I collected as much material as I could from the, the region in the village or outside uh, the, 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 the village in, in France. And I, I guess almost everywhere in the world, uh, they had or have a location where garbage was being dumped uh, before recycling. It was usually a pit and they threw everything in it. Uh, so this village as well, they had um, a site outside where everything was being thrown in. and. In, Already for a long time now, you have this uh, recycling scheme centers where you need to go sort your garbage and so on. Uh, but the old uh, areas are still there. They're like black spots. Um, so this one was cleaned. It was covered with dirt and uh, out of a, an, uh, a location of shame. They wanted to make a location of pride, something you can visit. Um, and we installed this big, uh, neatly cleaned kind of garbage ball. Um, and I also invited the, the local inhabitants to um, donate a uh, work or, I mean, an object, something they have in the house uh, that they wanted to attach uh, to the ball um, to somehow uh, make sure that they, were, that they would be part of um, this preservation uh, project, I would say. And it's still something that is... That is uh, uh, changing uh, because yeah, some people go there to take things out and others go there to put new things in. So it is a, still an evolving uh, process, uh, the ball. But it's still there and it it, uh, it still looks good. And th this idea of, of uh, preserving is, is something that also uh, came about uh, in, in this research on, on, on genetology, the science of first things, um, because when you look at the future past, you also look at the present. Um, and if you look at the present, you can imagine, okay, what is there something we can consciously uh, choose to be preserved? Is there something that we want to represent human civilization in the far future? And you have uh, these, these uh, attempts with time capsules that are either put in the ground, uh, sent in space on the Voyager spacecraft. So it, 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 it made me look more at um, key moments or key materials representing human evolution, human history, and imagine a way to preserve uh, that part. And this one is uh, specifically looking at um, the Industrial Revolution, which uh, originated in uh, Digbeth, uh, a small area in Birmingham, England. And when I was invited to do a residency there, I, I went to all the remaining manufacturing companies that are still in Digbeth. Uh, but it was a, a moment of transition so that the whole area was being gentrified and, and the, the raw manufacturing industries, they, they, they were being moved outside of the town. Most of them were actually closing and, and yeah, this, this manufacturing uh, industry is, is mainly moving uh, abroad. Uh, China, India, uh, they don't have such uh, regulations, labor is cheaper and so on. And I asked them to um, donate a pair of uh, objects that they were producing. And I collected uh, 100 uh, pieces, the last remaining objects of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, first I put them on a line, uh, making, yeah, I would say, uh, quite clear reference to the Ark of Noah, uh, but then in the, uh, the shape of objects. Um, but it was only when I uh, asked a, a photographer, a portrait photographer, to take pictures of them, that for me the work um, was complete. Because what happens when you um, have a really sharp, zoomed image of two screws, you see that they are not the same. And yeah, for me, that was almost like a, 
yeah, a proof of the failure of mass production. Uh, we think we can mass produce objects and constantly make new copies, but actually you can't, because there's always either color or shape or there, there's always differences. Um, and the result is, is that they become individuals and with, with a pair, they become couples. And then uh, you have, uh, you need two to reproduce and uh, for me then it, it, it made much more uh, much more sense but it's also a work that developed uh, developed over time and then when I was done with the objects I went to a metal um, squeezing uh, company and they were compressed uh, so these two blobs of metal are uh, each 100 of the same uh, objects but also with a very different uh, outcome I would say <clears throat> except for the weight. <clears throat> this is a more uh, recent work that also makes reference uh, to the, the Ark of Noah. Uh, I like stories a lot. There you will see more, more references. Um, doesn't matter where they come from or whether they're related with religion, but uh, stories for me is something that... Uh, yeah, I was always inspired by them, I guess, because they have... Um, yeah, a lot of potential to survive time because they're being told. Uh, uh, so it, it's again something that deals with, with um, uh, um, doubling on the pairing of objects. But this one is, is uh, much more uh, personal. It's um, all um, objects that uh, come from my mom, who was also an artist. Um, and yeah, she was kind of closing shop, <laughs> to say it uh, impolitely. But she was also moving uh, to the south of France to, to, uh, to retire. Um, and she, uh, she was an extreme hoarder. I don't know if you know that term. And verzamelaar, but really on, on the, in the absurd sense. Uh, she could never leave something uh, laying on the ground, so the house was completely packed with anything you can imagine. Uh, so I, I helped her uh, clean the house in her studio, and while doing so, I collected uh, pairs uh, of objects and I made a boat uh, out of it, um, called the other side, uh, making reference to the both sides of the boat, but also the, the vehicle that uh, helps you to the other side uh, when you die. So it is a bit of a, um, a monument for my mom and, and her uh, career. And um, it was for the, the Zeus Museum, and I was very, very happy that they decided to buy the work, uh, adding uh, more weight, I would say, to the, 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 the attempt to preserve uh, that and they meticulously uh, described uh, every object, photographed it, and, and created special cases, uh, yeah, like you would treat a Han vase from China, but they did it with these objects that are more uh, yeah, representative of the 19th, 20th century uh, contemporary Western human. Stones is something that um, I was also very fascinated in, uh, imagining um, how material um, will survive after uh, it, it has been changed. It's something that uh, Alan Weisman also talks a lot about in his book, how concrete buildings will behave when humans are all of a sudden gone. Um, bricks is something that I'm more related to, I would say, as a, as a Belgian. Um, yeah, but the, these kind of forms and shapes are, are um, stones that are grinded over and over again uh, in the river and, and eventually become pebbles, but human-made uh, pebbles. Or men uh, also, yeah, pillars, structures from a building. And um, after um, I worked for a long time, uh, specifically with plastic, um, I wondered what other materials uh, would remain uh, and, and in what kind of form or shape. And after 
doing research uh, to I think two years uh, I had to um, admit that um, yeah almost all materials have uh, a, a relationship with Congo and I'm from Belgium uh, Belgium had only one colony um, I didn't learn anything on sco in school about it uh, I asked some uh, kids now they still don't it's still not part of the curriculum uh, I'd say in most schools uh, I was a little bit reluctant uh, to go there. I went to Cameroon before. It was a very tough uh, experience, so I thought, okay, uh, Cameroon was not a Belgian colony. If you go to Congo, uh, it might be, might be worse. But I, I, thought, I, I felt I had to go because uh, almost all materials um, have this link uh, with Congo. And uh, so this was one of the first uh, works I, I made there uh, dealing with copper. I went to um, the copper mines um, and gathered stones and made uh, techno fossils out of them. And techno fossils is a, a term that uh, Jan uh, Jan Seewitz, um, who is head of the um, geological society that is doing research on the Anthropocene uh, at the age of man. I'm sure you all heard about it. Um, so he, uh, he is looking at also uh, what kind of um, material remains might be found in that layer that we are con cor uh, currently being uh, uh, currently constructing, and um, remnants of the technological revolution uh, will obviously be, be part of them. And then, if you look at a telephone, you take it apart. Uh, the 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 material that is uh, the most um, uh, prominent next to plastic at the exterior uh, is copper, uh, much more than than all the other uh, minerals combined. Uh, you might have heard of, of coltan uh, that it has been in the media a lot. Uh, blood minerals, uh, they are called. Um, it's such a small fraction. Uh, yeah. So if, if you if you if you look at, at the material on itself, uh, twelve percent of a telephone is, is is copper because of the circuit circuit boards. So I, I uh, yeah use that as as the main representing material for a telephone, and here I, I sculpted a, a Samsung uh, telephone um, directly in the rock. Because for me there was something uh, very striking uh, when I was uh, doing research on, on, on the telephones and the, the inside of it, is that um, at the source, at the origin, uh, people don't know what the material is being used for. But at the same time, the people that, that use the end product also don't know what's inside or where it comes from or under which conditions it is being uh, harvested. So there is this huge uh, gap between the, the, the origin and then the, the final uh, end consumer. And so here I try to put the two together directly sculpting and taking the telephone out of, uh, out of the rock. And it is being presented uh, in Congo for the Lubumbashi Biennial on a big billboard also to, to yeah, show it also commerci commercially or, or yeah, almost making a promotion campaign for uh, the, the, the ones who made the biggest contribution to the actual existence of a telephone. <clears throat> It's a different presentation uh, in the National Museum in Lubumbashi, but for uh, with the same same purpose. The stone is still there. Uh, it, it's in the geological department. Uh, they took away the stone that represents malachite, um, uh, which is the the, the natural occurring uh, form of copper, or where they extract copper from, and it's being replaced by the sculpture with two telephones in it. Uh, so it does still represent malachite, but it also allows uh, people in the museum to tell a different story connecting it to the actual production of uh, telephones. How are we with time? Um, okay, I worked with some, some local uh, artisans on the, on the market in Lubumbashi who, who make sculptures out of malachite. Um, but they, yeah, they usually 
they actually only make objects that don't have any relationship with the actual use, use of, of copper afterwards. They make elephants, ashtrays, eggs, pyramids, uh, things for tourists, but nothing that makes a connection with the actual use of it. So I convinced them to make uh, copies of iconic uh, telephone models and also uh, sell them uh, on the market, laptops. And they are uh, sold next to the, uh, the animals and uh, other... other. <coughs> this is more looking at the uh, circuit boards. It's a, again uh, using a, a similar uh, kind of focus or, or um, interest, but with a different outcome. These are representations, um, geographic, um, no, topographic drawings of the biggest copper mines in the world, and they're being transfer transferred on um, circuit boards that they use to make uh, uh, computers, but also that are inside every telephone. And it is using the same uh, technique. Uh, it's like a photographic development, uh, basically, that you do in a chemical bath. Um, but it is making a different kind of uh, trajectory um, and circuit than uh, an actual functioning computer. A different work with, with um, circuit boards, but also from a, a perspective uh, from the far future, uh, making more reference to the garbage that is floating around uh, in space. It's, it's a a whole new section in archaeology called space archaeology um, because if uh, for whatever reason again it's always speculation in the far future earth doesn't exist anymore the only thing that represents human presence is the garbage that is floating around in space and the few remains on the moon and other planets uh, where uh, you have landers and, and things like that so imagine if that are, those are the only pieces of the puzzle to try to understand what human civilization was about. Big challenge. Um, here I didn't go that far in that scenario, but um, it is already um, taking into account that the, the current computer age uh, is, is about uh, um, to be uh, taken over. Uh, the, the, the current uh, computer uh, technology is, is uh, based on silicium, on, on hard matter, um, and um, we reached, uh, the, uh, when I was telling about uh, the column that evolutions follow each other faster and faster and faster, uh, the same goes for knowledge and um, the, the possibility to store uh, information. It, it is being doubled faster and faster and faster, and at the same time the, 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 the storage shrinks in size but we uh, reached a moment where it is not possible to continue that, uh, the law of more, I remember. Um, so already for, I would say, a decade, uh, they're looking at new materials that might replace the physical computers. Also here in, in Utrecht uh, University, the Department of uh, Computer Sciences and, and um, Artificial Intelligence uh, is working on that. Uh, so the next computers will be soft, will be liquid, will be organic, uh, based on uh, DNA and RNA. And once that is being established, um, then the body will not uh, push out an, an alien material anymore. So then it will finally be possible to uh, uh, augment our uh, own um, brain capabilities. and. Um, then the question obviously is, can you still talk about a physical human being? Is it still human or uh, when, when, when do we arrive at the moment that we have to uh, say that there is a different kind of species? Uh, and there is already a lot of adaptations that we have, hearing devices and pacemakers and so on. Uh, we change, uh, we can replace a lot of body parts and some people have a lot of them. So when, when, when do we arrive at this shift that we have to say, okay, this is a different species uh, like we did with the geological layer. 
so it deserves a new name. And so th this was the beginning of, of that research, um, looking at the remnants of the old-fashioned computer age, uh, not knowing what they were for, uh, and, and seeing all these uh, trash floating around in space. So this is a, an attempt to um, yeah, recreate a satellite to reestablish contact, because most of the satellites are not uh, in function anymore. They are, it's called a graveyard orbit. It's a safe orbit which uh, doesn't make them fall back uh, on Earth, so they, they keep circling around, uh, around Earth. <clears throat> this is uh, silicium, uh, the material that I talked about before. This is the, 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 the beginning of um, the inside of a computer, let's say. Um, and silicium, strangely enough, it's, it's one of the most occurring uh, elements on Earth. Uh, after oxygen, uh, it is the most uh, uh, present uh, material uh, on the outside of Earth. It just needs to be um, purified. So the silicium that we're using, um, or silicon, uh, silicon that we're using, uh, sil that's where Silicon Valley comes from. The silicon that we're using in uh, computers and telephones needs to be 99.999% uh, pure. And the method that they use is a Kriswalski Kris method. Uh, in, you have to imagine like a, a sugar spin. So it is a, a small uh, tube that is spinning around and uh, being heated up in a furnace and then the pure silicium parts attach themselves to it so you get this kind of a stalactite cone and then it is being sliced in, in super thin uh, slices on which they imprint uh, with other materials uh, the um, conductors and, and, uh, uh, and memory uh, devices. This is a, a next uh, uh, step of uh, the work with, uh, with uh, silicium. Um, also, uh, the, in, in, in all these works, there is a little glitch or, or a little loss of knowledge or uncertainty of what it was used for. Or it, 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 It's not practical, but it has a reference to some elements of what it was and what it was used for. So here you see um, the big, and uh, this is the biggest size uh, silicium wafers that you have. So it is when this big carrot that you saw before is being sliced, <clears throat> on which I printed um, enlargements of uh, diatoms. And diatoms are, uh, I would say, almost like lifesavers. Without them, we would be dead. Eh? They, they produce oxygen in the ocean. And uh, they use also uh, silica, because uh, si silicium, in the form um, of uh, silica, it's almost in every sand or clay. That's why it's so abundant, but not uh, so pure. They also use it to uh, create their external uh, skeleton. And what they discovered is, is that they are um, very, very, very good in uh, transforming energy uh, from the sun. So the, the, what they're doing now, uh, the next uh, solar uh, generation of solar panels will be coated uh, with um, the diatoms at the bottom because they are much better than us. Uh, they had millions of years uh, to, de to develop that uh, technique and they can boost the productivity of solar panels by four, which is uh, in in incredible. Biomimicry, uh, a typical example of uh, stealing uh, knowledge from nature and uh, turning it into our use. So that's why I created this kind of a solar panel um, setup, but they all feed uh, through copper wires, uh, a human brain also made of uh, silicium. Again, with this idea of, um, well, you have human mastery, uh, it's in, at the center. We all make the rest of the world and the animal uh, and plant kingdom work for us. Um, but it is it is a, a human brain that is um, yeah about uh, about to change. And so this is where I wanted to uh, come to. It's it's called the last human. Uh, it's the last um, I would say old old fashioned way to try and and enhance um, human capabilities. Uh, there, there have been a lot of attempts 
uh, with old-fashioned computer technology to um, get more uh, storage, uh, to be able to store more information. But uh, the body doesn't, uh, doesn't like it, so it's being uh, pushed out. When uh, computer technology will have changed, we will be able to um, keep it uh, inside and, and have it merge with uh, our physical, physical body. So this is the, uh, the, the last, uh, uh, I would say, uh, middle-aged method to, to uh, change uh, our capabilities. Um, okay, um, uranium, another material, um, I would say the most likely to be uh, serving as, as uh, the golden spike, they call it. It's, it's the, the moment on, in which one geological era uh, is turning into another. So all of these um, moments in time um, are commemorated. They are spread out over the globe. Uh, in order to have a, an equal distribution of uh, that iconic marker. It's, it's basically a, a, a copper rod uh, that is being um, pushed in between two layers of uh, rock representing a different uh, geological time. So whenever they uh, started uh, yeah, contemplating on the Anthropocene, um, and they decided now, okay, we are in a new geological era, then they still had to decide what is the turning point, what is the moment where the Holocene becomes the Anthropocene. And the moment <coughs> that um, the first atomic bomb was detonated, uh, I would say as, as the, the most chance of, of being uh, nominated uh, that prize, um, because it, it created such a, um, a, a widespread uh, presence of uh, strontium-90, uh, anyway, some uh, remnants of, of all these uh, atomic bomb uh, tests uh, that can be find, found everywhere on the world as a, as a layer in uh, uh, future geological uh, eras. Um, so uh, what I did here is um, transfer an aerial view of the first atomic tests um, in um, on Trinity in, in the States uh, where they had the gadget uh, explode. And it is being transferred on a slab, slab, a slab of lead, uh, which, is, which used to be uranium. And so when, whenever uh, the decaying process uh, of radiation of uranium is over, uh, you have lead. Um, and that's why it's also such a good protection against um, uh, radiation. I made three of them um, to make a reference to uh, uh, the Trinity, um, but also uh, because uh, events are always being remembered uh, in, in a different way. Whenever you try to copy something, um, specifically when humans are involved, uh, you always end up with a, with a different result. Uh, because yeah, humans tend to be very uh, subjective. That's why it's so hard to have a, a common understanding of, of history. Um, it is so uh, different and, and is changing the whole time. <clears throat> Manhattan Project, uh, that's the, the, how the project was called the, for, to make the development of the first atomic bomb. Uh, they made three bombs. Uh, the first one, the gadget, was the one that they uh, exploded as a test. Uh, the second and the third, Fat Man, a little boy, they dropped uh, on Japan. And um, yeah, that's when uh, the project was over. And it's, it's again one of these examples uh, that um, pointed me to Congo, but yeah, most people don't know the relationship uh, with it. If you know something about atomic bombs, it's usually uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the final arrival point of the bomb. But uh, the source of the, of the main material uh, is uh, Shinkolobwe in, in Congo, that's where Roughly 80% of all the uranium came from in the Manhattan Project. Um, so yeah, this work um, makes uh, tries to 
um, make um, the first explosion um, with uh, uranium glass. And it, it's something that uh, for a long time was used um, for household uh, materials because it looked nice, it created a nice kind of uh, shiny color. Uh, it's not much, eh? it's about 2% of, of uranium. But when they started the Manhattan Project, uh, nothing could be used um, for commercial purposes except for uh, the creation of the bomb. So I, I, I started collecting um, pieces of glass on the flea market. And actually, the only way to, to know whether it's real uranium glass is with a, with a black light, uh, because then it becomes, uh, yeah, it, it starts to, to, to radiate. And then I found a, a glass blower that was crazy enough to remelt uranium glass and then blow uh, in it to, to create this uh, the, the mushroom cloud. And it has this, this beautiful bubble after 0 0.025 seconds before you have uh, the, the, the mushroom that goes up. You have this beautiful ball. And Inside you see the, the various attempts and failures, so a lot of it is uh, broken glass. Uh, and only in the center you have this uh, the successful test, let's say. Okay, this is uh, the last work. The, the most recent work I made was a commission for uh, the Riga Biennial. And again, I, I looked... Um, yeah, locally, okay, what, what kind of objects are um, emblemic, uh, I would say, or, or, or representing uh, that, that place or uh, the moment in time in which that place was important. And during the time of the Soviet Union, it was the, the, the main manufacturing uh, hub. They created almost everything. So everything you see here, bus, car, motorcycle, bicycle, radio, telephone, uh, and then when you go smaller up eh, on the, the right side, you can still see the, the Minox camera. Uh, for a really long time, it was the smallest camera in the world. All uh, security agencies had it. It was a spy cam. And then the, on, even higher, you have um, a transistor. And that's the only object that is still being made. Everything else is, is, is gone. So you see this... Uh, uh, the, the change in evolution, progress, things becoming smaller, um, and, and you see the change from a manufacturing industry to a service industry. So I collected uh, samples of all the different uh, objects and vehicles that were produced there and put them on a, on a spike, like you would uh, when you collect uh, beetles and insects, also as a kind of a preservation uh, project. It was outside in the harbor, and in summer, yeah, it's one of the, the, the main hangouts uh, for the kids in town. But what happened really, really uh, surprised me. Uh, I'm, I'm not... Um, um, I'm not a, a big user of social media. Uh, I was never on Facebook. Uh, I only started uh, on Instagram, I would say, like a year and a half ago. So, I, I, And it's the first time that a work created something that, that uh, yeah completely completely blew my mind because people uh, went there and and they had some kind of a uh, yeah uh, nostalgic uh, post soviet uh, kind of uh, <laughs> i don't know things coming out people went there with all sorts of vehicles with their dogs uh, the whole family climbed on top of each other it, I, it, it makes reference to um, the Bremer uh, Stadsmusikanten, uh, the, the, this, uh, the, the Bremer city musicians, where you have a, a donkey, um, a dog, a cat, and a, and a rooster on top of each other. And Riga uh, happened to be the sister city of uh, Bremen, which when I um, proposed the idea, I didn't know. But So the actual sculpture, um, or a, a copy of it, is also standing in Riga. So for people there, it was it was a very uh, clear and understandable uh, reference. But uh, this nostalgia that somehow, yeah, I don't know, uh, I didn't know what to do with it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether it is a period to be nostalgic about. But 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 um, yeah. So it it, it drew uh, such an amount of people there. Um, and they were putting a lot of images on Instagram. So I started to collect them. And this is just a small uh, fragment, but it was like an endless flow of, of people 
yeah, posing for it, uh, a lot of um, photo shoots with models uh, in front, uh, with completely dressed up. It, it was it was crazy. Or a DHL, you see uh, this one here. It's a DHL van that uh, went in front of the car and then took a picture. And uh, yeah, it's it's endless variation. Uh, uh, some video clips they they made there. Um, yeah, it was it was uh, really nice, and now they are looking into the possibility to keep it there, and it's the same thing as with the boat. You know, when 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 a work like that, which is dealing with preservation, uh, when a city or a museum decides to to follow that thought, let's say, and 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 decides to preserve it, then then it it uh, yeah, you have a, a whole circle. Then it then it really uh, makes a lot of sense. So I hope it will it will work out and that it's going to be installed there uh, permanently. Okay, thank you very much uh, for listening. <clears throat>
um, the genetology. Well, not necessarily, because there's always a promise attached to it. The ones that behave well, they either end up in heaven or being, they become the chosen ones. Um, this I, I definitely uh, want to uh, leave or out or, or avoid. Um, Yeah, for, I'm, I'm, I'm always very cautious about uh, using uh, morality uh, in my work, um, specifically for the reason uh, that uh, what is right and wrong uh, changes uh, a lot over time and depends on, on the position you stand in. Um, and if you... Add the, the, what I try um, in, in my work is have as much distance as I can. Uh, that's why I like this, this notion of the uh, cosmonauts um, of uh, when, they, when they see Earth for the first time from a spacecraft. It's called the overview effect. And it, it always has a, a peculiar impact on, on them. And, and it's something that they want to transmit to, to people that haven't been able uh, to leave Earth yet. Because it, 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 it really makes you understand how, well, not only how insignificant we are, but how interconnected everything is. Because from, from space, well, you might see the Chinese wall, uh, you might see like uh, centers uh, of, of light, but you don't necessarily see borders, and uh, you see continents, uh, but this, the, the way that, that humans have divided the world is, is completely virtual. And uh, it's also quite recent that we started to understand that winds don't stop at the border, you know, so pollution doesn't stop at the border. Uh, the plastic floating around, uh, well, now in the air, but uh, before in, in the ocean, uh, it is, they call it international waters. Uh, it's nobody's responsibility, but it, it, it just makes you realize that you're on this blue marble and 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 that's it uh, so i for me it's really important to uh ha have as much distance as possible uh, not only in space but also in time and in time uh, i'm sure that uh, the first thing that will go out is uh, is morale you know you it's it's really hard to say okay this is now something you 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 should do or you you shouldn't do so i i try to avoid that as as much as possible mm -hmm. <clears throat> um another thing that i had to think of is this whole um phenomena mainly from uh, anthropology of first contact um and i see a lot of first contact um imagined situations in your work, like um, imagining how um, things would be seen if found by a, another generation. Um, um, and um, some of you well, might have known, be familiar with, the, uh, uh, with this uh, phenomena, how, how um, but also like the connected cargo cult, that's maybe even a, a better uh, connection, how, how uh, objects from a certain civilization are reinterpreted uh, and given a new meaning um, uh, by people from another civilization without knowing the original meaning. Uh, like the famous example, uh, um, your, your countryman, uh, Jon Gimon Pre in his film, uh, Koba Weng, uh, referred to that as uh, um, how um, um, uh, objects that were brought to Papua New Guinea, Guinea uh, um, by explorers uh, got an almost religious kind of status in, in, in the uh, um, uh, indigenous cultures. Uh, uh, do you see any parallel? Is that kind of an inspiration? Yeah, no, totally, it? absolutely. I mean, that's where this work is also talking about, because uh, everybody in, in, in the room um, had to, uh, um, how do you say that? Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the For a word uh, in Dutch, Herzin, review. review, yeah, review, uh, review their uh, uh, knowledge about um, where we come from as humans. So even just looking at ourselves, uh, we constantly need to uh, adapt to to new discoveries. And uh, specifically, recently, I would say in the last twenty, thirty years, 
it happens every two years, every three years, that there is a, a new bone that is being discovered that proves that either we're older, we come from a different area, uh, we spread around the globe in a different order. The result is, is that uh, everything that we learned before is not necessarily true. But when, when do you know, uh, okay, now we arrived at the moment that this is what it is. There is always this, <clears throat> I would say, level of uh, subjectivity uh, that I think you need to include when, when you deal with, with, with knowledge and, and somebody telling you something in a book, in, a, in school. It's hard to, 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 add to, to arrive at this, uh, I would say, this a moment of truth. There's a question. We have a microphone yeah. question, so there is it. Thanks. Um, linking a bit to the question of Arjan and also to what you're just saying, um, and to the work in Riga, for instance, but maybe also the, the let's say, the boat. Um, how do you deal with this aspect of nostalgia? Um, or what's your... Yeah, m maybe just how, you, how do you deal with it? What role does it play? Because it seems that nostalgia uh, has quite a different link to... Um, uh, um, yeah, thinking about the future, thinking to the end of the world, there's this subjectivity in it, but also um, something like super emotional in a way, and uh, like non-rational, let's say non-overviewing. Um, yeah, so I'm curious how that, how you deal with it. Yeah, that's, I, I realized that uh, at a certain moment that that is obviously my biggest handicap, is that I'm also a human. And uh, I'm I'm dealing with with uh, yeah human emotions that maybe uh, make it impossible to to be uh, let's say completely uh, objective or 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 have this outsider perspective. It is is just impossible, um, and it it it's not just being human. It's also being born in this time and age. It is being specifically born in Belgium. Uh, being white, uh, being male, uh, you, you have you have all these uh, defining characteristics characteristics that make it really hard to be um, a floating rhizome uh, in space in ten thousand years uh, time. So I'm 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 completely aware of that, um, but it yeah it doesn't mean that um, yeah you cannot try to to uh to have as much uh, objectivity as uh, as possible but it is it is a, an extreme handicap yeah it it also with uh, the um, the, um, the whole science of first things genetology it is it is so subjective um it 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 depends on first of all what i find uh, how i search a search engine giving me certain results then the selection that I make of what I think is important or, or valuable, um, it, 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 it proves the subjectivity even more, uh, I would say. Yeah. And nostalgia, that's also a good one. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know how to deal with that uh, because I also have that. I have. I, I'm. I'm. I'm bothered by by nostalgia, um, by things that I have the idea were better before, or that I think okay, this would be really bad if they are gone. Uh, and that's that's something that I think is also really uh, human. That's something that that maybe. Is, is most uh, omnipresent in, in any any culture because it's part of uh, aging. And when uh, you see it always, when when people get get older, uh, they have a much wider time span uh, to look on to, and uh, a lot has changed in over time. And whenever there is things that remind them of a certain moment in time in which either they were happy or they they liked a lot. And it's not there anymore. Yeah, they get nostalgic, and um, it. it I, I, the only thing I try is is not to have morality included in it, uh, so that 
I wouldn't say that you, you cannot be nostalgic uh, of the colonial times, for instance. That's something that, that for me was also really hard to deal with in uh, going to Congo, is that there is a lot of uh, colonial nostalgia in Congo by black Congolese. And yeah, the first reaction you have is like, ah, no, you shouldn't, you know, it was really bad and, and we came there and we, we did bad things to you. Yeah, but we had electricity at that time, and now it's not running anymore. So that it, that it's really strange how how that works in the in a in a human uh, brain. So to to detach it from morality, that's at least uh, at least one thing. But nostalgia is a is is a is a big uh, how do you say it? Uh, it's a, very difficult to get around it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Maybe um, also in this uh, the pieces of you that I saw in, in Riga um, in pinpointing progress. Um, um, well, uh, the, the success, as you showed it, of the piece was also that it was uh, Instagrammed a lot. Um, does it make you look different at your own work? Um, or some of your pieces have a very clear, um, humorous aspect to it. Um, uh, this one and still it's very deep and it makes you think about things um, but w pieces that come across an audience and have an effect faster than others does it make you look any different at your work or decide to do to follow any tactics uh, in order um, to have a wider audience to share your thoughts with or I'm just wondering what this Instagram success of your work, uh, of this specific work, um, uh, means to you. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> also asking, I was uh, in um, in Bangkok at the Bangkok Biennial, and I've never seen a biennial with so many artworks that seem to me to be chosen for their Instagrammable potency. <laughs> yeah. And you see people looking, students all the, and they're not barely looking at the artwork itself. It's just yeah. a nice background for the picture. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, that's a tough one because it, it, it's too short uh, afterwards uh, to say whether it had an influence on on, on my work afterwards. It's it's uh, the the last big work uh, I, I made. Um, so in five years I might be able <laughs> to answer that. I, I I hope not. I'm I'm also not sure if I will uh, survive another five years of Instagram because it's 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 really it's a big mind fuck. Because I, I was never on social media before, so now I, I realize what it does to you, how it changes your perception of reality. Uh, the um, perception of being, I don't know, uh, exposed, visible, liked, disliked, popular, unpopular. Um, I just didn't know what it was, but I. I that's why I started um, an account because. I have two, two uh, nieces, uh, 12, 15, and um, I, I was really feeling that I was uh, becoming a, a dinosaur, but too fast, too uh, quickly. I was missing out on something vital that had such a big influence on, on, on the human uh, self-perception and perception of the rest of the world that I, I had to, uh, uh, yeah, at least know what it was. And and now that I'm on it, like for a year and a half, I I, I really feel that it has a enormous uh, influence. So I'm I'm not sure whether I will even be on Instagram in in, in five years. Um, if I see that it has an influence on my work, uh, a bad influence, <laughs> because that's also a thing, of course. When the work gets better, uh, why not? Um, but when you're constantly thinking about Instagrammable uh, works and, and uh, yeah, that it is something that fits uh, in this format and, and, and that success is measured uh, by the amount of likes, uh, whoa, I think then uh, I throw out the phone uh, or Instagram uh, pretty fast. Uh, yeah, I hope. <laughs> A any last questions? Well, we'll keep following you on your Instagram and checking <laughs> if you're selling out or not, or follow you up on your website, which is also a very informative, uh, a very uh, comprehensive overview of your work, I must say. It's a very nice website, maatvandeneinde.com, I think, or yep. .com. Um, so you're invited to uh, uh, join us for a free drink to compensate for the cold. Um, and I also would like to thank Maarten van der Heide, of course. I would like to thank the Pakkegrond again, and I would like to thank you all for coming.